A lot of questions continue to trail the seemingly intractable challenges of Nigeria's power sector. There's an overriding view among Nigerians that for as long as this sector remains unfixed, the economy would remain in a perpetual state of arrested development. Shall now be spending some time discussing this subject with engineer Bex Dagogo Jack, a former chairman of the Presidential Task Force on Power. Welcome to the program. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Engineer Dagogo Jack, good morning. Thank you. Yes, and happy new year. Good to see good you morning. in the new year. Good to yes. be here. You're welcome. Well, let's talk about the power sector, focusing particularly on electricity supply. We're told that the Nigerian government has spent uh, as much as 1.7 trillion naira on that sector since uh, President Buhari assumed office. And yet, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, delivery, we're still hovering around the pre-privatization threshold of 4,000 uh, megawatts. How do we explain this? What is the problem? Why is there no efficiency still, in spite of all efforts and the huge amounts of money that have been uh, spent in that sector? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, let me start by saying I think um, President Buhari needs to be appreciated for not um, yielding to the pressure to just play uh, politics with electricity. As you would recall, um, the extreme flank of the government at some point were more interested in chanting about $16 billion and stuff like that. But I think the president rose above that and uh, decided to engage the sector and drive it from, for progress. Um, I know that if he didn't commit to the sector uh, as he did, there was a high probability that the market would have collapsed with horrendous you know, consequences for both the citizens, our economy, and our social security. So I think it was good that the president rose above merely playing politics with electricity and engaging with the sector. I once said this, um, I need you to understand that what happened in 2013, December, was just handing over the sector. That was not the end of the privatization. Pretty much that was the beginning. Um, it needed to be you know, nurtured. It needs to be closely marked and monitored. But the post handing over management of the privatization agenda had hiccups, uh, a lot of hiccups, I'm, I'm, being, I'm understating. So when that happened, the, the, the market seemed to have spinned out of control. And that needed to be reset. Uh, I, I don't think we're even on the page of resetting. We're still dealing with the spin, the spin off of the market. So to that extent, you will have problems with um, justifying how, how much you spend just to correct a situation that is out of order. I'd said in a different setting that, that we, we have a situation where you need to spend money correctly. You know, you can't use good money to chase projects without an organized process. Otherwise, you can't justify um, every cover for the, that you have invested. Generally, that's my sense. But overriding uh, point is that it was good that the president rose above uh, the politics of power sector and decided to manage the sector for progress. He did that in many other areas, including decoupling the power sector uh, from the former bundle, um, engaging to conclude uh, Mambila, uh, and also um, uh, taking a position to engage Siemens. So a few interventions shows that the president is interested in a new narrative in the power sector. Now, recently, there was an increase in tariffs, which generated some controversy among stakeholders, including some court cases and an intervention by the National Assembly. Why should Nigerians pay more when there's scarce supply? Tricky question, as usual. We, we, we need to be more educated as a country, as customers, as citizens, as stakeholders, on the role of tariff as a tool for driving up uh, sector capacity. Um, it's done everywhere. 
As I speak with you, Nigeria probably ranks around number 11 or 12 in terms of the, the, the highest tariff in Africa, not in the world, in Africa. Now, what does that tell you? It means that everybody has, who has a dollar to spend would rather go to a place where the tariff is more friendly than to, to go to a place where the tariff is depressed. Because the, the lower the tariff, the more difficult it is to recover your investment. So basically, we need to understand that tariff is not targeted to punish, rather to create uh, opportunities for volume, for, for increase in capacity, which typically often resolves the issue of pricing. If you have enough of everything, the price normally goes down. If you have very little of something, the price is always abnormal. So I think that we need to understand tariff from that perspective. Otherwise, we'll keep struggling with it. And we need to also transit from the mindset where we started, when government owned all their assets and pretty much gave everything free and didn't ask for accountability. That regime will never give you more power. Because if it could have given us more power, we wouldn't need to privatize. But when you privatize, tariff becomes the tool. And you need to manage that with a certain level of intelligence and understanding. But would it be a fair statement to say that the current situation in the power sector is just unviable and incapable of closing that demand gap any time in the foreseeable future? I would say it is true, but not uh, to, to underscore it that it is a snapshot in time. As we speak today, yes, we have a very difficult story to tell about our electricity market, but it's a snapshot in time. If we do the right things and uh, we stay focused, we don't take one step forward, two steps backwards, because of the huge population, the huge market that we have here, I still see this as a very viable electricity market, but we have to do the right things. As well, we speak now, we have not done that, and we have a very unviable market as we speak. Well, we we'll uh, you know, uh, shortly, but let me ask you this, as a follow-up to some of the things you have said. You said tariff. Uh, could be used as a tool to increase uh, supply, uh, maybe perhaps even eff efficiency. Now, does it really, you know, follow? Would that really be the case when you have a situation whereby uh, the national grid is perpetually collapsing? In the year 2019 alone, we were told the national grid collapsed about uh, 10 or 12 times. This year again, we have had cases of uh, uh, national grid collapse. And the first question I had asked you, that how do we explain the fact that we're still at the level of 4,000 megawatts? Where is the problem? Is it with transmission or with generation or with the uh, distribution end of the value chain uh, in the electricity sector? But we'll take a short break now. When we return, uh, I would like to take your response. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Still with us in our Abuja studio is engineer Bex Dagogo Jack, former chairman of the Presidential Task Force on Power, who has been commenting on developments in the power sector in Nigeria. Yes, uh, engineer Bex Dagogo Jack, I asked you a question before we went on break. What is the guarantee that a higher tariffs will translate into uh, better supply and efficiency? And why is it that the uh, national grid is always collapsing? Where really is the fault line uh, in the power sector? Is it generation, transmission, or distribution? Or perhaps policy? Thank you. Thank you. Solid, yeah, sol solid question. Um, when you have grid collapses, it shows how weak and fragile and vulnerable the national grid is, which is a fact. Nobody is going to paper over that. Normally, the national grid should have redundancies that can come into play when a particular, there's a particular fault line that triggers, it jumps into the next line. At the willing level, that's transmission, also at the generation level. So you are able to interplay with the, the forces of supply in the transmission uh, process. But if you have very little redundancy, then you are exposed, you're vulnerable. That's how we continue to have system collapses. There are projects to increase our redundancy. I don't know how far they have gone in terms of you know, delivering them, completing them, but 
we, you can't run an effective power market with a fragile grid that doesn't have enough redundancies to cater to unplanned uh, uh, situations that we get to have. That's explaining why we have grid collapses. In terms of why we continue to struggle with capacity on the grid, you're right. There is too much misalignment from upstream to the downstream. I will unpack it and make it look a little simple. Without gas, we can't do much about generation. So our gas inflow must be of a particular level to take care of the, we are more than 60% dependent on gas for electricity. So we need to have enough gas. We are not doing too badly on that front, if you ask me. Now, when we get to generation, we have a situation. A lot of people think that we're still in the government regime. We are not. We're in a private sector regime. And the only thing private sector understands is cash flow. So once the cash flow is bad, it affects, corrupts everything. It's like a virus. So once the cash flow is bad, and I'll get to that later, but at the generation level, we have at least 10,000 megawatts of available, constructed, commissioned capacity. You want to explain how come we have 11 at generation and we're struggling to have 4.5 in the homes, in the offices, in the marketplaces. Almost 7,000 can't be explained. A lot of money anywhere else. You price keeping 7,000 megawatts a day idle. It will tell you it's huge money that is going there. Now, when we leave generation, we go to transmission, you're struggling with around 6,000 megawatts. A confident transmission capability. It shouldn't be there. It should be matching generation and distribution. When we get to distribution, it's even a much more you know, serious story because over time, from handover to now, the level of attention to detail in terms of asset maintenance has declined. So as we speak now, I'm not too sure whether distribution as a whole can take up to 4,005 or 5,000 megawatts. Even if we have that available, because of commercial constraints and commercial weaknesses in the way their business have been conducted without enough control and enough sensitivity to tar tariff, many of them would prefer A, to reject the power after a particular threshold because they won't be able to pay back to the market, or B, to increase their so-called, uh, uh, what do they call it now, uh, uh, metering, uh, estimated billing, which is some kind of a black market way to, to show up their losses and stuff like that. So you, you, across the value chain, you have dysfunctional issues at every spot, which needs to be addressed, focused upon, and dealt with rather than um, think that they would do it on their own one way or the other. No, it's still a privatization exercise that is still in its formative years. It needs to be controlled. It needs to be managed. It needs to be dealt with, monitored closely and dealt with. And we need that to happen. Thank you. So based on the foregoing, all you've described, the declining supply levels, declining investments in green and brown fields, rising unsettled market liabilities, would you say the privatization exercise was a failure, as a lot of people do? There's a lot of temptation in many quarters to, to just get anxious, to feel like um, we did the wrong thing, and all that, and all that. I, I like people to come back to reality, to have the perspectives right. Um, government ran this business for 40 years or thereabout, and it did the business very poorly. Government spent billions and established assets across the value chain from generation to distribution, handed them over to SOE, state-owned enterprises, with no model for accountability. They were not even paying taxes, and every year they were taking money from the federal budget, but pretty much nothing to show for it. By the time we, this uh, privatization agenda and the reform was rolled out, we were doing under four, uh, 2,000 megawatts of uh, power with all the huge investments that I've just uh, alluded to. Government decided to privatize because they've got it to their neck. It's enough. They couldn't manage that format anymore. 
the country population was growing at an alarming rate. Government's ability to match up in terms of investment and performance in supply was negative, not even positive. So to that extent, it's a reality check to move away from that former way to the, the next option. We, it's an imperative, pretty much. Now, was it perfect? No. But because a lot of templates were studied before this template was developed, I know that it was doable. It, it had factored in a lot of the issues that should crop up. The challenge we had was that everybody assumed that handing over was the be-all of privatization, whereas it's actually the beginning of managing the uh, privatization process. And we handed over, we, are, we left the scenario thinking it to take care of itself. It never does. I think that is a situation that we can reset. It can be done differently. Thank you. Certainly. And I'd like to take us back to a topic that we mentioned at the start of this conversation when we brought up Siemens. And let's really look into that, because at the start of his second term, President Buhari signed this, or there was that signing ceremony with him and Siemens with regards to this great news that we all heard of an increase from 4,000 megawatts to 11,000 megawatts by 2023. Yet, there have been barely any reports in the media or follow-ups with regards to this project. And, of course, citizens would like to know what's going on. So, firstly, do you see any merit in this project at all? And then to add to that, what is the current status of the ongoing partnership that we're supposed to have with Siemens? Thank you. Um, yes, again, I think this has been discussed probably in another forum. I think that the Siemens intervention... Uh, it's a great move. Um, I say so because, especially because, immediately after handover, a few mistakes were made in terms of managing the sector. And that has disrupted a lot of issues in terms of asset maintenance, in terms of human, human capacity, deployment of uh, technology. So the, the sector has become even more depreciated than it was before handover. Now, this kind of injection of uh, uh, an initiative like this could do a lot of corrections, even while we, we begin to deal with the, uh, if you like, regulatory and commercial components of it. But this in intervention looks like targeted to reclaim, recover lost capacity. I'm talking technical capacity, equipment, and asset capacity in the sector across the value chain in a way that will not be an excuse for the discos especially not performing, because most of the depreciation and the distortions took place at the disco level. And as you know, the weakest link in a value chain is always the trouble for making the value chain work in any market situation. Now, as we speak, the disco is the weakest link in our value chain. And unless we get the disco situation right, we won't be able to get the kind of monies that can fund the market that can uh, operate the market? Well, I mean, so many issues in I the power sector. I addressed your question. So many issues in the power sector. But one other concern yeah, which, by many yeah. Nigerians is about the leadership in that sector. You've talked about what uh, President Buhari has been doing uh, to ensure that that sector is not politicized. And at least one thing he did was to uh, make the power ministry. The Ministry of Power is a standalone ministry. Previously, it was power, works, and housing. And now we have a new minister in charge of power. But Nigerians are also concerned about the performance of the present minister of power. They've been asking the question, why is it that his voice is never heard? Why is he not part of the conversation around these key issues? Uh, some people have even asked whether he's a ghost worker, or maybe he has a silent strategy that defines his own uh, style. But what's your own assessment of engineer Salima, man? as Minister of Power. Do you think he's uh, achieving or he's just overwhelmed? Um, let me be honest, I'm not kind of close enough to give um, a credible evaluation uh, in the sense that somebody can use those assessments for any uh, fit purpose. But I'm a Nigerian, I'm, a, I'm an uh, interested stakeholder. Uh, the sense I get uh, is that the, uh, the, the sector is very, very deep, complex, and dynamic. It's a moving um, vehicle, moving train, if you like. And um, 
getting to understand it and master it won't take a few minutes, won't take a few moments, won't take a few weeks. And so I get the sense that there is effort aggressively to kind of uh, hold rein over the sector. Um, I also picked up from the media his effort to focus on, on Mambila. Um, give or take, that for me is a good move because if you look back six years from handover, pretty much you can't say there has been any kind of private sector uh, investment project coming into the market, which is scary if we get everything right, but generation is not matching up at the right pace. We have a problem. So working on Mambila and hoping to unlock 3,000 megawatts of electricity could well be the biggest chunk of energy addition into our market uh, from the kind of landscape that I see currently. So I believe it's trying. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, Tundu, we still have the engineer Dagogo Jack for, with us. You still have a question for him? No. You don't. Well, well, but just before you go, because we still have... By, uh, by, the, by the way, may, may I just, may, uh, yeah. please may I just add that the question as to whether the, uh, the Siemens, what is the progress on the Siemens? I'm not familiar, I'm not in the system, but because it's a German-Nigerian corporation, typically those kinds of agreements take much slightly longer time to, to, to wrap up, and that's only... A guess from Does that from affect the start. given Thank deadline, you. though? Does that affect the given deadline of 11,000 megawatts by 2023? It definitely would do so, because every moment lost has an impact on the end game. Well, mm -hmm. we need to go in about uh, just 30 seconds. Estimated billing is another uh, major concern for electricity consumers in Nigeria. You, you, you are in support, obviously, of tariff increase. Do you support estimated billing? Mm -hmm. No, I don't. I actually think it should be criminalized. Um, I think that the model for getting it right is there. It's a corporation. It's a matrix of forces Absolutely. that should be deployed to well, make sure that Thank you very much, from Engineer Dagogo Jack. On, on that note, we have thank to uh, bring this to a close. Thank you very much indeed.